Uh, even though the, uh, her accent may deceive you, she got her master's from uh, University of Alabama in uh, 83. I thought that joke was going to go much better. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we'll stop the introductions. <laughs> stop while you're ahead, Tony. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, but she got her uh, a BA from Trinity College in uh, Dublin in 1980, uh, PhD from University of Kentucky in uh, 85, and then came to the Bureau in uh, 1987. And she's worked on a variety of projects. I think they all sort of have that, that theme of looking at uh, fluid flow, solute transport. Uh, she's worked on projects that look at uh, climate variability, uh, change of precipitation, and how that affects uh, water resources. And also fluid transport uh, related to uh, radionuclide transport with uh, uh, waste disposal, in addition to many other projects. And then also part of this talk is uh, Ashraf uh, Rateb, a, a postdoc fellow uh, working with Bridget here at the BEG. He's been here for uh, two years. And uh, he got his uh, PhD from uh, University of National Cheng Kung University in Taiwan in uh, 2017. And with that, I'll let Bridget uh, give her talk. Okay, thanks. Um, I don't recommend jumping from the crowd. <laughs> I'll try anyway, Toti. <laughs> um, so I was in uh, Midland uh, the last couple of days at um, uh, Permian Basin Water and Energy Conference. We hear a lot about uh, water energy nexus uh, these days. And I mean, you know, you kind of get tired of the, the, the things, nexus this and that and the other thing, you know. But really, uh, it, it is in spades, you know, when you see how integrated they are and what they're trying to do. And then the other thing that we hear these days is, you know, water scarcity, global water scarcity. And, uh, we're all in, in big trouble, blah, blah, blah. But water is not a global issue. Water is a local issue. And, um, and uh, listening uh, to the talks, it was mostly panel discussions. So you have midstream water companies with over half billion dollar investments, about 20 of them in the Permian Basin. And uh, they are, um, you know, managing the water and providing the water to operators. And it's sort of like going to, to Starbucks, you know, where you have your phone and you never actually have to shell out cash. You know, you just put your phone on there and you look at them and say, that was just six bucks, you know, for what? You know, and, and they don't even see it, you know, they just their phone, you know, money doesn't really mean anything. Uber the same way, you know, you just take Uber. You know, can you ask somebody, are you going to the airport? Could I get a ride with you? They look at you as if you have 20 heads and you just say, uh, I'm trying to conserve my carbon footprint, you know. It's just, I'm mean, you know, I don't want to pay 25 bucks for an Uber. But so a lot of things these days is like, where did that come from? Where did that food, where was that food grown? What's the impact on the environment? Go to AGB, you know, it's grown in Mexico or it's grown in California. So why are we using all the water and depleting the aquifers? So with the, the energy stuff, you know, the midstreams, they're producing lots of water. What are they going to do with it? They want to clean it up and put it on uh, irrigated agriculture. One term I heard was Permian paradise, you know. Uh, and so we would irrigate lots of land and we would have Permian paradise. Um, but, uh, but it does, you know, energy does make a difference. And when I talk today, you know, uh, energy and cheap energy would make a difference in how we manage water going forward and how we can do it more sustainably. And, and the same with food, you know. I saw clippings recently, um, you know, uh, 80 acre farm near uh, Cincinnati. So stacked uh, buildings where the cheap LED lighting was making them uh, it, uh, possible for them to grow kale and all these other vegetables near Cincinnati and then just sell them. Uh, so a 20th of the footprint uh, of, of the land. So why are we growing all our food in deserts now? You know, because we have solar energy, we have soils, but then we're nuking the aquifers. But maybe we won't do that in the future. Who knows? I mean, things changing all the time. So um, Ashraf Ratab is a postdoc that did a lot of the, the work on this that I'm going to talk about today. And um, we also work with the retired USGS, huge workforce, and they're incredible because they have worked on so many different things. Alex Sun, Bob Reedy, and then Center for Space Research. We work with them a lot on the uh, satellite data. And uh, this is a Powell Center project, which is supposed to bring NASA and the USGS together. Uh, so you know, they're sort of allergic to each other. And uh, NASA wants to kind of suggest that they invented everything the last few years. And USGS has been doing it for a century. 
So trying to bring these two thing, groups together has been beyond my skill set. But so we just work with individuals. <laughs> And then I would also like to uh, acknowledge the Jackson Endowment. I'm, um, I think I realize more and more every year how difficult it is to get support and getting the Jackson Endowment 10 years ago, and I'm extremely grateful for that, and also for the Fisher Chair, uh, because it has given me a lot of flexibility and um, also more pressure, I think, to do more things. But I also try to spread the wealth and help uh, other people. So... Um, Okay, um, so uh, a whole bunch of people, and the reason we have a whole bunch of people is we want to bring the community along with our thinking. We want to get their input, and then we want them to, to use the results and, and consider it. And I think that has worked for us in the past. And I would like to mention one of the people that got us very involved with the Gray Satellite Data has been Zishan Zhang, and uh, he um, is in Wuhan, and I just feel really sad for those people. Uh, and um, uh, Ashraf was telling me, he was talking to him recently, he doesn't have internet at home. I mean, can you imagine, it's bad enough to be at home all the time and not be able to go out, but I really feel uh, bad for them. So we have modelers, we have satellite people, we have other groups uh, working with us. So this is the, the outline of the talk, uh, provides some background information, objectives and the results. Um, talk about climate and human impacts on water storage, and uh, then um, look at the groundwater and uh, compare the groundwater data from GRACE with the groundwater level data. And we're very fortunate in the US that we have a lot of monitoring data, thousands and thousands of wells. Then also compare the results with regional groundwater models and uh, global models. And then in the end, talk about approaches that we can take to make water management more sustainable. So i um, not sure if many of you know what a television is, you know, <laughs> thing we used to look at a lot uh, when we were growing up. But Leslie Stahl and 60 Minutes program several years ago, 2014, uh, had this program, and, talk, and here she's talking to Mike Watkins from NASA about gray satellite data. I really enjoyed the 60-minute program because she gave equal time to the U.S. Geological Survey and monitoring groundwater levels and drilling wells and all of that aspect as to the gray satellite data. And so it was a very balanced uh, report. Um, then uh, Sasha Ritchie and JFM Yeti and others uh, talking about uh, uh, large groundwater basins uh, that, uh, and, and the number of them that are depleted or water scarce. And uh, the uh, interest that uh, was uh, put on the California Central Valley Opera from the Gray Satellite data, that we could never get that uh, attention with just groundwater level monitoring. So the Gray Satellite data focused attention on that, and then the legislature uh, has put forward, has passed the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. So I think that will really help uh, in California. And then uh, Bill Alley and Lenny Conico uh, talking about uh, some of the uh, concerns with uh, uh, gray satellite data and some of its uh, limitations. Hydrologists would like it to be small scale, and it's really, it's large scale. It's just like a parent who would always like their children to be doing something they're not doing. <laughs> um, so a little bit of background on uh, gray satellites. Um, some people may consider it a, um, a religion, uh, but it stands for Gravity Recovery and Climate Experiment. Um, it was launched um, on St. Patrick's Day in 2002 and um, decommissioned in October 2017. And the GRACE follow-on mission was launched in, uh, in May in 2018. Uh, so it consists of uh, two satellites uh, that um, uh, follow each other. Some people call them Tom and Jared. They're about 200 kilometers apart. And by measure, monitoring the distance between the satellites to micron scale resolution, you get uh, the spatial and temporal variability in the Earth's gravity field, from the atmosphere to the MOHO. Um, and uh, so these satellites are 450 kilometers above the land surface, and so that limits the spatial resolution. So hydrology, well, how can you give us higher resolution? Well, if you put the satellites at a shallower elevation or closer to the land surface, you could get higher resolution, but not, it, it, it's uh, not linear. And also, those satellites would, uh, there's atmospheric drag, and, uh, and, and you would, uh, their lifespan would be much shorter. We're very fortunate uh, that these first two satellites, their projected lifespan was about five years, but they lasted about 15 because solar activity was so low 
uh, that, uh, during that time, but it's not supposed to be the case for the new satellites. And the new satellites are similar uh, to the original satellites, similar elevation and all of that sort of thing. So they feel like they got it right the first time. So the spatial resolution, 100,000 square kilometers, uh, it takes about uh, 90 minutes to make complete one orbit, and they provide the data at monthly time scales. So uh, you get a complete global coverage um, a couple of times per month, but then they reduce the uncertainty by aggregating the data. So one gigaton mass change is equivalent to one cubic kilometer of water. And uh, for people with English units, I go back and forth, uh, one million acre feet is 1.2 cubic kilometers. So uh, pretty close. And it measures total water storage. So the processing centers remove the atmospheric effects, the tidal effects, ocean effects, and you're left with the, the water storage from the land surface to the deep subsurface. So um, we're very fortunate in the U.S. in that we have fantastic aquifers, yeah, you know, huge aquifers. Uh, you don't have these in Australia or you don't have these in Africa. So, uh, and here, just give you an idea of the, the various aquifers um, in the northwest, uh, the Central Valley Aquifer, Sacramento, San Joaquin, the High Plains going from Nebraska to Texas, uh, the Colorado and the Arizona alluvial aquifers. Um, and then in the humid regions, the Mississippi Embayment, Texas Gulf Coast, Ed Edwards Trinity, Coastal Lowlands. So all of these, and most of them, the High Plains is generally unconfined throughout, uh, but uh, most of the other aquifers are stacked aquifers with shallow, unconfined aquifers and deeper, uh, confined aquifers. Um, so this just uh, gives you an idea. So Lenny Conoco did a lot of work compiling water, groundwater level data and regional models, and uh, this is um, uh, a USGS uh, report uh, where he shows depletion from nine, uh, or changes in storage from 1900 to 2008. And it's probably mostly reflecting 1950s onward because then we had more pumpage then. Uh, but you can see, you know, huge depletion uh, in the Central Valley, um, Arizona, uh, and the entire High Plains is painted as red, minus 340 cubic kilometers over uh, this time period. And uh, the Mississippi embayment, also large water storage change. And, um, but increases in water storage in the northwest, the Columbia and the Snake. Any ideas why that would be? Climate change, right? <laughs> Pardon? Global warming? That's the answer to everything, right? <laughs> Any ideas? Yes. Mm -hmm. So surface irrigation, surface water irrigation, recharging groundwater, and increasing groundwater storage. But I mean, you know, you, you see papers where they say national climate assessment, you know, the north wet areas are getting wetter. So uh, when I show Grace data, they'll, they, they say, you know, that the increase in storage in the north reflects wet areas getting wetter and dry areas getting drier related to climate change because climate change drives everything. Um, so anyway, so you get a feel, you know, for the, the depletion um, uh, in these aquifers from Lenny's data. And then if you're going to consider a time period closer to the grace period, uh, 90, uh, so this would be 2000 to 2008, you can see still large declines in the High Plains, Central Valley. But uh, look at what happened in, um, in Arizona. Any idea what caused that? Come on, Jack. Yes, right, the Central Arizona Project uh, pipeline from the Colorado River uh, to uh, those aquifers. And so they started using surface water and managed aquifer recharge and started recharging the aquifers. Uh, but in most of the other places, you know, we're seeing uh, large declines in storage in the recent period also. We, you know, people talk about water scarcity, but I really think uh, the, the better thing to talk about is we have too much or too little, and how are we going to manage these extremes? We're either in floods or droughts, and we certainly know that happens all the time in Texas. So how are we going to manage those extremes? You know, so what do you do, you know, when you have too much money and you don't have any money? You put it in a bank, you know, you bank it, you store it, 
or you can transport it, you know. So at the conference the other day, somebody says, well, we're flooding in the, in the Missouri. Why can't we just pipe that water to the deserts, you know, and stuff? And everybody thought, oh, this guy's crazy. But no. I mean, they're doing it in China. The south to north water diversion, they're taking from the Yangtze in the south in the humid region and moving it north to Beijing and other cities, you know. So they're doing it, but it takes energy, and it's expensive. But uh, these are some of the things that people are doing. So managing these extremes, I think, because I'm in Texas, I don't talk about climate change, but I talk about extremes. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm going to try to um, address some of these questions. What controls water storage changes? We need to understand what controls the water storage change if we're going to manage them. Uh, you know, is it climate? Is it humans? Is it both? You know, if it's humans pumping too much water, then we need to decrease the pumpage. If it's floods and droughts, we need to store more. So it's important to, to, to get it right, you know. And so we see a lot of papers where they say, uh, humans, big bad humans, you know, they're pumping too much water. And, uh, and then later papers say, no, it's really the opera responding to uh, drought, you know. So, um, but it's the first paper that sticks. So we should be a bit more cautious about what we put out early on. Uh, and now they're saying, well, it's, it's all climate, uh, because even if it's the humans increasing pumpage during a drought, that's climate driven. So it's all climate. Um, then how much does, uh, do groundwater storage anomalies contribute to total water storage anomalies that we see from GRACE? Um, and then how well does GRACE derive groundwater storage anomalies compare with groundwater level monitoring data? and with regional and global models. Um, and what we, can we do to better manage the aquifers? So some folks from NASA that I saw at AGU, they said, no point in looking at the US. We have plenty of data. That's not why GRACE was developed. You shouldn't be bothered comparing it with anything. Uh, but I mean, if we don't have confidence in it, if we don't compare it to these data, then we really won't understand how reliable it is. So uh, here's the uh, total water storage trends from 2002 through 2017 in the different aquifers uh, from GRACE. Um, so you can see Central Valley, uh, but uh, less depletion in the Sa Sacramento than in the San Joaquin, which is the uh, Tulare Basin, which is much drier. Minus 18 cubic kilometers in Arizona over this time period. Uh, minus 40. But look at Nebraska. I mean, Lenny painted that all red. But really, Nebraska is quite different uh, from Kansas and Texas. Why would that be? What's different about Nebraska? It's not Texas. <laughs> they have some surface water, the surf and they have some surface water irrigation. And they have different soils and recharge. Uh, but you can see, you know, uh, Edwards Trinity Plateau, some depletion, uh, Texas Gulf Coast. Uh, but look at Mississippi embayment. Do you remember what Lenny had for that? Like minus 60 cubic kilometers uh, uh, from 2000 to 2008. So now we have NASA duking it out with USGS. Who's right? Um, I mean, it really is uh, an important question that we're grappling with. And then some uh, rises in these humid regions and also rises in the northwest. Um, so then looking at uh, the uh, long-term trends then in total water storage and comparing it with the drought monitor. Uh, so this is the Nebraska essentially. And so you can see drought in this period here up through 2007 and declines in total water storage. And then uh, wet period and recovery. And this is the cumulative precipitation anomaly in the background. And then the 2012 drought a flash drought and a large decline, and then recovery after that. Uh, so it's really very dynamic in Nebraska. And then this is the uh, central and southern high plains. Um, so you can see, you know, we don't have any surface water. We have, we have fires, you know, which recharge ephemeral lakes. Uh, but you can see during the 2011 drought, uh, um, more depletion during that period. And then 
uh, some slight recovery, but this uh, long-term drought. So the droughts are sort of similar, except in the central and southern high plains, they were longer during this period, and so uh, more depletion. But we don't have much recovery in the central and southern high plains. So this is total water storage. It includes soil moisture and surface water, but uh, uh, we'll see later that there's, they're not uh, that important. So this is the accumulated drought severity and coverage index. It's just one number to reflect the drought, and you can see that um, uh, over the same time as Grace, you can see larger numbers here um, uh, in the southwest and then less drought uh, in the humid regions and in the northwest. Um, so that's just one number to try to uh, synopsize the, um, the drought index. So then if we look at uh, all of the uh, basins uh, in different regions around the U.S., these are the uh, time series then, uh, for example, the San Joaquin Tulare, uh, you can see uh, drought 2007-2009, 2012-16, to 16, and, then, and then the drought ends overnight. What happens? What happened in California to end that drought? An atmospheric river from uh, the um, Hawaii, uh, from the, the Pacific, just dumped a bunch of water on, on California, and overnight it's done kind of like Harvey ending a drought. So you really need those huge floods to end a drought because the drought accumulates so much depletion, you need a flood. I mean, we saw it in, in Australia, you know, floods ending the drought, a uh, 13-year drought. Uh, but it's just uh, really stark, you know, it, it's just sort of ended overnight in December. It was before the snow, uh, but snow is very important in California, so that was a good point. Uh, so you can see Arizona, it's almost, uh, some people talk about a mega drought. It's just kind of been in drought the entire time and just a declining uh, storage. That would be much worse if they didn't have the Central Arizona project. Um, and uh, then the uh, Southern High Plains, we saw that earlier. But you know, the Texas Gulf Coast, you can see going up and down uh, related to wet and dry climate cycles. And also the Edwards Trinity uh, Plateau. But you can see the 2011 drought. Um, and then uh, some of these other in more humid regions. But look at uh, the uh, Mississippi embayment. You know, when we looked at uh, Lenny's data, we saw a huge decline in storage. But here we just see it just bopping up and down. You know, so, um, and then here in Columbia and Snake, we don't really see a correspondence between total water storage and uh, the drought and climate because of the surface irrigation is masking it. Um, so climate is a very important driver, and drought is a huge driver of water storage changes generally, uh, but not in all cases. Then what about the impact of human water use? Um, so here we've got the Columbia and the Snake, and uh, the light blue is surface water irrigation, and the dark blue is groundwater irrigation, and as Jack mentioned, changing irrigation. So a lot of surface water irrigation in the Northwest. We talk a lot these days about managed aquifer recharge and uh, that uh, it has to be intentional, you know, that you're putting the water on there for recharge. But, you know, the aquifer doesn't understand whether it's uh, intentional by humans or not. So if it gets the water, it just uh, responds. And so here we're seeing those aquifers responding to um, surface water irrigation. And we also hear a lot about, you know, we need uh, precision agriculture. Uh, we need to conserve water. Um, and so in Australia, in the Murray-Darling Basin, they spent about 6 or $7 billion on precision agriculture, uh, lining irrigation canals, piping water. But they didn't take into account uh, that uh, they were losing that return flow and that recharge. And so now they're in another drought and they're uh, in trouble. Uh, so it's, and you know, people say, well, if uh, somebody said to you, you could do whatever you want, sometimes it's hard for us to figure out what to do. Um, and we learn from our uh, mistakes. But so here then uh, you can see water use from 2010 and 15 in each of these uh, different aquifers um, over time. Irrigation is the dominant water use and then uh, everything else is under other. Uh, so uh, do we see, so for example, if you're looking at California, uh, Sacramento, and San Joaquin, does water demand increase during drought? 
So 2010 was a, a wet year, and 2015 is a drought. So you can see in Sa uh, San Joaquin Tulare, the total water demand did not increase during the drought, but the surface water contribution decreased a lot, and the groundwater contribution, the pumping, increased a lot. Uh, so we have more water coming from groundwater, removing it from storage. Um, we see there's not much irrigation in the Edwards Trinity Plateau, so that's just responding to climate, wet and dry climate cycles. Arizona, you know, we have more surface water irrigation, but then groundwater pumpage increased during drought. Uh, Texas Gulf Coast, not much irrigation, and so it's uh, responding to climate. Um, Mississippi, look at all the groundwater pumpage in the Mississippi embayment. It's much, even much bigger uh, than California. So why are we not seeing a depletion from grace? Any ideas? That it's too coarse. Right. Right. Uh, so you can have local hotspots of depletion. And, um, but, you know, 70% or 90% of the pumpage in the Mississippi is from the Mississippi Valley alluvium. And it's very connected to the surface water system. So even though you're pumping groundwater, you really may be just capturing surface water. And so maybe the regional models, uh, the ones that were developed before, are too coarse uh, to reflect that. So they're missing, maybe missing it. But now they're doing a lot of um, uh, electromagnetics along the rivers to figure out the connectivity between the surface water and groundwater. They're doing airborne EM, and they're talking about managed aquifer recharge and all of these things. You know, So maybe they didn't really take it from storage. Maybe they were really capturing more of it from the surface water too. But I mean, in the snake, even though it doesn't look bad overall, you do have the hot spots of depletion in the aquifer there. Uh, so this is uh, Ginny McGuire's groundwater level map uh, for the High Plains. And you can see the uh, yellows and greens and blues are where we have increases in storage. Uh, and so much of Nebraska. And you can see along the Platte River, uh, where they're irrigating with surface water and increases in storage. And in this region here, which is the sand hills, but you can see uh, in Kansas and uh, Texas, uh, you know, uh, huge declines in storage, more than 150 feet. So uh, the increases here are partly related to the surface water irrigation and then also um, high recharge in the sand hills. Uh, this is uh, based on uh, chloride data in the groundwater, Bob Reedy's work, um, and much lower recharge down here. And uh, that partly reflects the, the texture. Uh, this is a lot of sand, the sand hills, and there's no ag, there's no irrigation. So that's like a, a recharge basin. Uh, and down here, you know, it's like cement, some of it. You know, Pullman clay loam. You couldn't get anything in it except through the pliers. Um, so uh, then uh, these long-term groundwater models that the USGS developed, then these are extremely interesting. And uh, so you can see uh, the Columbia uh, Plateau and, uh, the, uh, and Northern High Plains. So this is Nebraska just going up and down. And uh, the Columbia Plateau, an increase in storage of about 20 cubic kilometers, or uh, 20 million acre feet close to. Uh, so they sort of built up the aquifer with that surface water irrigation. And the last several years, they've been using more groundwater irrigation. Uh, this is the Mississippi embayment, you know, huge declines from these regional models. And this is the, the Central Valley. So, you know, the snow and all the water that comes in from the mountains surrounding the Central Valley really help with recovery, you know, during some periods. But it's not enough to counter the huge depletions. This is um, 87 to 92 drought. Uh, you know, and then some recovery, but not enough. And then the recent droughts. And this is uh, the Southern High Plains. Uh, this is uh, in Terra's model, uh, Neil Deeds, you know, just a, a one-way street because we don't have any surface water or other ways to, to recover. So uh, then comparing the GRACE data then with uh, groundwater level data and regional models and global models. So... Um, 
This is a, a disaggregation of the time series of the uh, Gray's total water storage, groundwater, soil moisture, surface water, and snow. And this is the, the dark blue are the long-term trends. Uh, the lighter blue is interannual, and the very light blue uh, is seasonal and sub-seasonal. So you can see long-term trends in Southern California, uh, and this is controlled by groundwater. Long-term trends in Arizona, and that's controlled by Lake Mead mostly. Uh, central and southern high plains groundwater. So most of the long-term trends are controlled by groundwater. Soil moisture is mostly just a seasonal variability, and surface water storage and some of the large reservoirs are some long-term trends also. So this is uh, the black line uh, time series is total water storage, and the blue line is uh, groundwater storage after subtracting snow, soil moisture, reservoirs from uh, the total water storage to get groundwater. So you can see the groundwater is the dominant uh, input to total water storage from grace. Uh, some soil moisture during droughts and things like that, but for the most part, uh, it's the groundwater signal that uh, controls the great grace total water storage. And you can see these uh, numbers are very similar to what we saw from total water storage. And this is uh, comparing with the groundwater level data. So thousands of wells in different regions. And you can see very good correspondence in many of these systems with the high correlations between grace, groundwater storage, and groundwater level uh, levels in the different aquifers. So it suggests that uh, grace is tracking the dynamics of the groundwater storage. Not so good in some places, the upper Colorado uh, and uh, Columbia because it may be masked by surface water irrigation. Uh, but basically, GRACE is tracking uh, the, uh, uh, the water storage. But we're not looking at the magnitude, because we didn't convert the groundwater levels to groundwater storage. So we have problems when we try to estimate groundwater storage from groundwater level data, because we need to know what the storage coefficient is. And when we have unconfined and confined aquifers, that can be range over orders of magnitude. So it's a very difficult thing to scale up from groundwater level data to get groundwater storage. Then looking at the uh, regional models then, this is uh, the black line is GRACE, and then this is the regional model in California, the Central Valley Hydrologic Model that the USGS developed. This is the uh, Mississippi and Bayman. So this is where we have a huge discrepancy uh, between GRACE and uh, groundwater uh, and the regional models. And so we've been talking to the USGS guys that do that regional modeling. But so they feel like they haven't kept, they haven't, didn't put in the surface water, groundwater connection, and the grid scale wasn't sufficient to capture that. But now they're doing a lot more work, and they're going to revise it. Uh, we have very little overlap period in the northern high plains, but the correspondence is good. And then this is in Terra's model in the central and southern high plains. So the model and the GRACE data are showing similar results. I think what's really interesting from the models then is that we have uh, these models from pre-development to recent. Uh, most of these are RASA models, but also some US uh, Water Vem Board GAM models. Uh, but look at the, the Columbia. You know, we built up this up from surface water irrigation, and uh, we're still not back down to where we were beforehand. And uh, the uh, snake, a uh, huge increase in storage. Uh, what is it, thousand springs and uh, all of this. So we're slowly eating away at that, what we built up in the bank. But um, And then the Central Valley, you know, we do get some recovery, but not enough. Arizona alluvium, uh, you know, big increases in, uh, or some increases in storage and then decreases recently. The, the northern high plains up and down, southern high plains, Houston, and, uh, you know, question mark about this one. But it's great to look at the long-term records. Then looking at the global models, because we've all got to work at the global scale these days. If you're not, you're just nobody. <laughs> um, but you can see the um, green line is uh, the average of land surface models from the US National Land Data Simulation System. And you can see it's sort of tracking the dynamics, but it doesn't have any human water use. Um, but it seems to be picking up some, but the um, global hydrologic models, water gap uh, and uh, PCR raster, you know, they're overestimating depletion 
in the northern high plains, and they're really not seem to tracking the climate dynamics. Uh, the central and southern high plains, again, overestimating depletion and um, uh, relative to what we see from grace. And, and uh, their human use is based on a global algorithm, global, you know, so, uh, I mean, it would make sense that you may not be getting it right. Um, and so then this is the Edwards Trinity. You know, these models are very flat, uh, whereas we're seeing a lot more dynamics from Grace and also in the Texas Gulf Coast, just some examples. But so here you can see for all of them, you know, th these were the big examples I showed earlier. Uh, but the, the global models don't seem to be getting the dynamics. Some of the, the land surface models seem to get it better, but they don't have any human water use. So we still have a long ways to go with these uh, models. So what can we do to make uh, water resources more sustainable? So I think one of the important messages from this work is conjunctive use of surface water and groundwater. Um, because surface water, inefficient surface water recharges groundwater. And if you put it in when it's wet, then you can pull it out of the groundwater then during a drought. So what does that mean? That means you have an irrigation system that can use surface water and groundwater. I mean, that's expensive. And people are used to using one or the other. But I mean, when you look at some of the irrigation districts in California, they're incredible. They're like, you know, they price the water uh, so that they keep the surface water and groundwater irrigation systems going. And during a drought, then they price it higher early during the drought so that the vineyards and the almond orchards get it and then uh, lower later in the drought so that the seasonal crop people will get it. I mean, it's just incredible. And the infrastructure and the energy to pump it into the ground and then pull it out. Uh, you know, it's just um, a sort of, uh, I, I really enjoy talking to those folks. Um, inefficient surface water irrigation. So don't make your surface water irrigation uh, really efficient like the Australians did. Don't spend billions of dollars on that because that's recharging the groundwater. And then very efficient a drip system than if you're using groundwater, but who's going to have both? Um, so if you don't have access to surface water, then you need to, re you can reduce the irrigation pumpage and Kansas is doing that and they will extend the lifespan of their aquifer and they're working with stakeholders and having a lot of success. And then managed aquifer recharge, uh, store excess flood water in depleted aquifers. And Chen Yang last year uh, quantified how much water we could capture in Texas if we took uh, 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 river water, um, high magnitude flows greater than 95th percentile. We could capture two to three times the water use in the state in a wet period from 2015 through 2017. And we could store those in the depleted Trinity, uh, the Gulf Coast aquifer, you know, but then that's going to take energy. And it's also, the infrastructure and the logistics. Um, so, you know, all this depletion, that's subsurface reservoirs that we could use. You know, so we could fill those up, make those aquifers great again, right? <laughs> See, they do laugh, Toti, when you get the right one. <laughs> um, but, but we're, uh, we're, um, <laughs> California is talking about that with the uh, Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, uh, you know, and uh, Representative Larson is talking about that in Texas, and um, Idaho is doing it, uh, and Arizona has that Central Arizona project taking it from the Colorado. They're doing it also. Um, so I, I spoke with the folks up in Idaho when I was over the weekend along, uh, about a year ago looking through uh, websites and I saw this stuff about the Snake River Plain Aquifer and what they were doing. And um, I was just amazed, you know. So, so they take um, water from the Snake River Aquifer and put it uh, up the irrigation canals. They're online, so they're recharging the aquifer and then put it in spreading basins. So, you know, over the past several years then they've been doing this and up to half a million acre feet in 2017-2018. I mean, that's incredible. But I mean, they work with the ledge for years and they got the surface water and the groundwater people going, working together, but they have this irrigation infrastructure to do that. 
And the surface reservoir people, this forecast informed reservoir operations. So if they were confident that they knew when wet periods were coming or they were going to have flood, they could offload that water from the reservoir and put it in the groundwater ahead of time and make more storage uh, space in the reservoir for flooding. Um, and all of this is going to take more and more energy. Um, so then to summarize, and I think climate is a primary driver of water storage trends. Droughts are very important. Uh, human water use can amplify those climate extremes if you're going to pump more groundwater during a drought or dampen them if you have surface water irrigation, uh, like we saw in the Northwest. Um, and Grace, you know, comparing Grace with the data in the U.S. seems to compare favorably with groundwater level trends and, uh, um, you know, generally consistent with regional models, but we have limited overlap period, but a big inconsistency in Mississippi. But they're doing, USG is doing tons of work in the Mississippi these days. And um, I think the global models are overestimating depletion in groundwater storage and uh, trying to move towards more sustainable management conjunctively using surface water and groundwater and um, managed aquifer recharge um, should help. Um, so uh, this is the Powell Center, and, you know, in order to create this combia between USGS and NASA, we have to do activities like this. It's a real challenge. <laughs> Nobody threw anybody overboard. <laughs> um, Again, um, NSF and USGS Powell Center, but uh, um, Jackson Endowment, Fisher Foundation, and all of these things have helped give me some flexibility uh, to explore some of these things and work on things, um, you know, more than I have contract work. So I'm very grateful for that. I would be glad to answer any questions. Uh, any questions? Jeff, uh, Bridget, I think you guys hear me. Oh, yeah. Okay. Bridget, I, I, I've been pleased to see on some of the uh, studies using GRACE, they're now starting to put uncertainty estimates on the GRACE. Would, would you comment on that? And uh, looking at um, some of the projections of changes due to, due to future climate change, I'm not seeing uncertainties in those projections. Could you comment on the uncertainties? Sure. Yeah, yeah. So um, our, our studies on looking at GRACE started with the people from Center for Space Research uh, getting tired of people saying, you know, your GRACE data are all over the map. And, um, and so they fired back and said, oh, we think the models are all over the map, you know. <laughs> So we have great solutions from different processing centers like uh, NASA Jet Propulsion Lab and uh, Center for Space Research and German groups. And uh, so when we estimate uncertainties, we just take the standard deviation of all of these different solutions. And uh, we've got about five or six different solutions, and so uh, we look at the variability among those. And sometimes there is large variability, like in our recent data for Florida, Center for Space Research was quite different from JPL, and, and they're working on the analysis. Uh, so there is uncertainty in, in GRACE uh, data, and, and uh, we've been uh, tracking that. But the uncertainty in the models, as you saw from the global models, uh, is much larger. and even you know, when you uh, invest a ton of effort like that Mississippi embayment model, they may be conceptually wrong, you know, and they may be missing the capture of surface water. So the message is look at everything uh, and look at all sources of data to try to constrain our understanding, our conceptual understanding of how the system is working, and then to constrain uncertainties. Um, so I do, I have seen papers. Uh, you know, where they look at all of these models and they, they show the uncertainty and they say the hydrologic models, the global hydrologic models are even much more uncertain than the climate models. And the climate models are using an ensemble of, you know, lots and lots of models. So they're starting to recognize that. But when we tried to publish some of our stuff earlier comparing with global models, uh, they said, uh, you know, why are they different? You know, why do we have so much variability? And we had all the modelers on the paper, you know, and they couldn't tell. You know, so I think we're starting to acknowledge uncertainty. And I think as the Grace people, at the large scale, 
uh, grace is much better, I think, than the models. That's its forte. Uh, but the models, you know, we're going up from grids. To, it's not its strength. So when you see a global model saying, talking about global sea level impact with one model, you know, I think we need to move beyond that. Any other questions? Uh, let me ask one on that. The um, one of those last comments you made about transferring water out of the reservoirs, kind of prior to a storm, is that 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 must inco involve I mean communication between so many different organizations to understand the impact of the storm coming, to know how much the percentage of the reservoir, and then actually move that somewhere. I mean, how far are we from getting that level of communication to, to make those uh, choices? Well, they have pilot uh, programs in um, in California now. A couple of different pilot. Pro programs and there were uh, posters at AGU on this, so they're really uh, trying to push that. But could you imagine, you know, you've diverted water from the reservoir and you didn't get the, the, the wet the thing that you were expecting, all of a sudden you're in jail. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we need to get more um, reliable forecasts and more confidence in those and then everybody to understand and get all of these people thinking together but when we started talking about excess water in texas from flood periods you know uh, the environmental flow people said there's no such thing as excess water we need that in the bays and estuaries but now they're they're acknowledging yes we could capture some of that you know and california is doing the same you know so it takes a while it's kind of like quitting smoking, it takes a lot of time to change people's attitudes about stuff, but eventually they come around. Sure. Thanks. Scott? Well, I think there's been a study done on the uh, Trinity Aquifer uh, near Dallas-Fort Worth, and uh, the uh, heads there are, you know, down 800 feet or uh, you know, down 1,000 feet. So take the water from those reservoirs and put it in the Trinity. Um, and, uh, and, and, and I would start there or even... Did the politics even... line up well for that? I mean, it's a, it takes a combination of things, technical plus other stuff. Is that a good place to start or are there forces that are too strong uh, opposing it? What... Well, I think, uh, and I'm not sure, maybe Andy or uh, Jack, you might know, I think HDR did, uh, our CDM or somebody did a pilot analysis of uh, the Trinity Aquifer and, and the potential for AS Aquifer storage and recovery there. Uh, it takes a lot of time because the surface water guys aren't used to treating water or used to doing that, and then the groundwater people aren't used to it. So it takes a lot of time. I mean, when I talk to those folks in Idaho, and, and what it took there, they've been working on that since about 2011. So it takes uh, a lot. And, and Representative Larson is moving uh, them, and, and they're making the legislation so it's easier to do and things like that. So I think it's going in that direction. But just like smoking, you don't start, right. you know, it takes a lot of time. But they've been trying to, uh, you know, change the, the, the regulations to, to, to uh, incentivize that and make it more uh, feasible. But uh, what, what I really enjoyed about talking to those folks in Idaho, and I think it was, I, I can't remember the agency, but I thought they were so smart. Because they said, you know, we have groundwater guys depleting the aquifer, but we don't want them... Uh, when they're using surface water to use efficient irrigation because then, and they knew that, you know, so, so they really were thinking about all of the things. And then they said, we're getting an increase in storage. We're not sure how much of that is because we've had a wet period and how much of it is due uh, to the transfers. They were thinking about all of these things and I was very impressed. Um, yeah. So just for quick history, there's a guy that used to be director here from 1960 to 1970 named Peter Flan. And he gave me some counsel 20 years ago. He said, think big, but when you want to get started, pick something you can succeed with, something small that you can succeed with. So I wonder if, if, if you were to put good thought to and with folks, the collaborators, about which aquifer in Texas we would recharge first, given the constraints of science and policy and reality on the ground, et cetera, where, where would we have the most likely chance to succeed? And then... Legislative session is coming up. Let's try. Very specific one thing where we go try to accomplish that. It's a big state. 
you know, so there are lots of possibilities. Rather than maybe, I certainly understand the big picture here and the benefits of all that, but we could be talking about this big picture as you and I know, 10 years from now and you and I will be walking in on our walkers and, you know, still talking about this thing. Is there an aquifer we can go do? What well, would it be? I, I, just, I just think it's not uh, the, uh, in academia we can do certain amounts of things. And so I think when Chen did that analysis of how much flow we could capture, it really helped. Sure. And we presented that at the ledge. But, you know, in order to make it, to make it happen at an aquifer, you know, probably need a pilot test and, yeah. you know, and things like that. Exactly. That's the kind of thinking it's going to take. And so who, who do we work with? Who do we, who do we collaborate with? Who do we partner with to go do the practical things? What, where's the water going to come from? When? How's it going to go in the aquifer? What, you know, and, and what different governments are going to be involved? Is it a groundwater district? Is it a river district? Who's going to be involved? Who are the key legislators? We put that all together and, and then go down and maybe say here, here, work with the water development board, whoever it takes, Bridget, to put together a group so that we can transfer this great work into an actionable attempt and see if we can succeed. And I think consulting firms have been doing that. I mean, uh, you know, CDM and others, and uh, maybe you guys, Jack, or you may know about, uh, you know. So I think companies have been doing some of that. Um, I mean, you know, one of the things that fascinated me being in Midland is, is all these water midstream companies. And they were talking about commoditizing water and things. So these midstream companies, there are about 20 of them, they have over... Uh, some of them have over half a billion dollar of e uh, private equity investment, you know. So they're going to be the Ubers, and they're providing operators with water. Where does it come from? I'm not sure, you know. <laughs> but uh, these are the ones that are going to be controlling things. And, and, uh, and I was uh, talking to some, and they said, uh, you know, I said, do you see much depletion or whatever? They're using much uh, fresh water, groundwater in the Permian. And they said... Uh, they're pumping it in, in Texas and then providing it maybe in New Mexico. And I said, is it uh, farms or is it a GLO? Is it uh, Texas Pacific Land and Trust? They said, it's a private equity backed big, uh, some big business. So, you know, these are the groups, I think, that are going to be, uh, and, and may change the, the, some of the water picture. Yeah, hey, Bridget, great talk. Uh, one kind of just follow up on that in terms of politics to make it work. I remember when I had a tangential role in the Edward, uh, the Saws Twin Oaks ASR project about 20 years ago. There is issues with the, the GCD and also with the project we have out in the Delaware Basin now is uh, the fragmented groundwater management through the different GCDs where there might be edge effects or aquifers that cross GCD boundaries. So districts, yeah. So you, I could see a role for having to build a team of GCDs and get you know, stakeholders on board that would not just be the one willing partner of a GCD to, to operate it. You might have to get the others around it on board as well. I'm not sure I have enough time before retirement, Scott, you know. <laughs> oh, no, I think we're changing the conversation. We are changing the conversation. And that's what you need to do first. And then you need to show how some states, I mean, I think this uh, emphasis on Idaho, I mean, and then other states, you know, will, you know, if other states can do it, then other states will start to do it. It's, it's just... Um, you know, I've only got so much bandwidth, you know, I, and we do too. But I mean, no, 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 but even, no, no, but, right, but we're doing that. We, we're, 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 we're talking to the water development board. We're talking to the in-stream flow people. We're talking to all these people that would be allergic to it so that we get them on board, you know. And we're working through the Bay and Estuary inflows, you know. So we're doing what we feel like we're we're best at, and um, you know, to try to. 
But I think on the oil and gas side, you know, working with the midstreams, which we'll start to do next week, you know, we will be trying to, uh, you know, change that conversation or, you know, at least monitor it and, and provide input. All right. Well, thank, thank you, you very, very much, much, Bridget. That was really engaging.